Good evening, beloved. Peace be with you. <clears throat> so tonight we are beginning kind of the new section, as Peggy said, and um, called basically growing in our relationship with God through prayer, worship, and scriptures. So we'll kind of break it up in different parts tonight. We'll mostly be just on um, relationship with God, what that is, what that means, what that looks like in different ways, how to grow in it in some practical ways, some practical ways of looking at it or a practical mindset. And we'll probably get into a little bit of, the, of prayer, kind of close with a little bit of prayer, and then next time we'll really get a lot deeper in prayer. And along the way, we'll try to do... Um, I'll do some scripture, some teachings, some examples. Hopefully then also pause along the way and just do some reflection time. So if you um, have a little notebook or a journal and you take notes, um, we'll have be a lot of different times for just reflecting on a couple of different questions in regards to our relationship with God, where you are, what you're desiring, where you want to go. And um, it's important to just take that time along the way and write things down and reflect with God and, and that that kind of reflecting and journaling is actually a good form of prayer. You can refer back to it and grow in it um, and, and, and look back in, um, at different times. So that's what we'll do tonight. So if you're coming mostly for prayer, I'm sorry to disappoint you. We'll get there, <laughs> you know, but we want to set the context just with our, our basic relationship with God. So let's begin with a little prayer. Father, we're so grateful for this time to be here together um, with you in your presence and in the presence of Jesus in the Eucharist and just united in, with your Holy Spirit inside of us. We just ask you to, we thank you so much and honor you for being here with us and we thank you for the relationship with you that we have and that we are growing in already all the things you've been doing in each of our lives to bring us to this this point. And sometimes, Lord, it's really can be helpful to, to be able to name different things or parts of our relationship or ways of growing in our relationship with you. So we just pray if we need to that you would give us the words that, any words that we need to describe our relationship with you, to grow in it, to name it, to recognize uh, maybe we're in a better relationship with you than we, than we realized. Uh, we, just, we just pray that you would um, help us with that, take any um, confusion away, just bring us, make it real simple for us today. We just pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. So I just want to start um, um, with some basic scripture, um, and quotes and do a little commentary along the way, setting, just kind of setting the context. It may be a little scattered at first. It's kind of been a scatterbrained day. Uh, so, you know, it's one of those days. But um, I'm trusting God will bring it all together. So just in, th in reflecting our, our relationship with God, what kind of relationship we're supposed to have with God, um, especially with Jesus, there's some good quotes that came to mind. And uh, these would come up in our in theology classes sometimes at seminary, but it was it was all to kind of set context and keep us focused. And so these are good ones to write down and kind of come back to. And um, I don't know, maybe you've heard of some of these already. So a first one, a first quote: uh, "What Christ is by nature, we become by grace." What Jesus Christ is by nature, we become by grace, a child of God. <clears throat> That's a real powerful quote, uh, if you continue to think of it, because basically you can then look at everything Jesus is in the scriptures, in the gospels, and realize that's what we are called to be <laughs> and to become by God's grace. 
And grace is oftentimes simply defined as a kind of a gift from God or a free gift from God. But a better definition that goes alongside that as well is um, God, grace, God's grace is God's energy, God's life. It's God's own life being given to us. And so what Christ is by his nature, by just naturally, you and I are invited to become by God's free gift of grace, of his life coming inside of us. A child of God. So we know that happens. That gift that's given to us is the Holy Spirit. We're adopted as sons and daughters of God uh, by the free gift of God. And therefore, but it's important to connect that everything that Jesus is naturally, we are allowed to, we, God wants us to be as well. There's no limits. That you can't, you can't no longer say, well, Jesus is God. I'm not. That's why he is that or he can do that and I can't. No, that's gone. That doesn't exist because whatever Christ is in his nature, naturally, you and I are called to become by God's grace. Maybe not all at once, but that's what God wants us to grow into. So there's no more limits. There's no more separation. Oh, Jesus is God and I am not. No. I'm not going to go too very deep into it, but just to quote a little scripture from 2 Peter 1, 4. Peter, first and second Peter, really good to read um, and keep reviewing because Peter is it's just really powerful and, and diving in deep in our identity as sons and daughters of God by baptism, by the gift of the Holy Spirit. And 2 Peter 1, 4, he just straight calls it out and just, he says, through, through these, uh, he, through God's, glo- God's own glory and power that he gives to us, he has bestowed or given us the precious and very great promises so that through these you may come to share in the divine nature. You and I are called to share in the divine nature. So we can't really say anymore, well, I'm just human. (laughs) God is elevating us, calling us to share in his own divine nature. We don't become divine autonomously separate from God, but God's saying, come share. This is what it means to come share in my life. Come share in my divinity. Another quote, very similar. The first quote, what Christ is by nature we become by grace a child of God. Second good quote. Um, all the early church fathers went crazy with this quote. They loved it. This happened. They all say it in different ways. Saint, Saint Irenaeus, Saint uh, Augustine, all the way up to our, it's in the catechism. The son of God became a son of man so that the sons and daughters of, man, of men could become sons and daughters of God. Did you catch that one? The Son of God became a Son of Man so that the sons and daughters of men could become sons and daughters of God. It's kind of this, it's like this, like a same, similar quote as the first one. <clears throat> In other words, Jesus traded places with us. <laughs> And said, I'm going to, everything that I, that I am and all that I have, I'm going to give to you. We're all going to get to be children of our Heavenly Father. And so I share with you my inheritance as a child, as the firstborn, only begotten Son of God. I give to you all that I have, all that I am. Give you, and I even give you my relationship with our Father. So that we can call him our Father. This is kind of good, just mind renewal stuff for our relationship with God. It's not as a servant-slave relationship. It's not, oh, God Almighty, 
master and creator who's way out there, and I'm just a little peon, you know, one of his creations over here. Like, the relationship God wants with us is family relationship, father-son, father-daughter relationship. Uh, it's not, it's, it's thicker than blood relationship. It's a spiritual union relationship. There's no division, there's no even separate spirits. We're all sharing and in the same spirit, the same spirit of God is in every single one of us. That should be mind-blowing. We're living and breathing in God and God in us. What Christ is by nature, we become by grace, a child of God. Everything that Jesus is, we are called to be. We have access to. There's no limitations. There's no separation. God really wanted this from the beginning. Oh, let me do one more scripture. Okay. The sons and daughters of man, the son of man became a son of the son of God became a son of man, so that the sons and daughters of men could become sons and daughters of God. John chapter one, verses twelve and thirteen. Well, chapter verse eleven. First, Jesus came to his own, but his own people did not accept him. But to those who did accept him, he gave power to become children of God. To those who believe in his name who were not born of natural generation, nor by human choice, nor by a man's decision, but born of God. That's powerful. For those who do accept Jesus, who believe in his name, he gives power to become children of God. See, that's what we're, this is the relationship. These are the uh, basic understanding of a relationship. What Christ is by nature, we become by grace. He gives us the power to become a children of God. And that means everything that Christ has, he gives to me and to you. Everything that Christ is, you and I are invited to walk in. And that's what it means to have a, a child of God. It's not just a fluffy saying. It's like, oh my gosh, you know, everything we see Jesus doing, is he's showing us how to be a son of God. And that's why he even tells us, I, uh, he gives us the, the other mindset. I can do nothing on my own. I only do what I f- see my father doing. I only say what I hear my father saying. And so that tells us you and I are supposed to be paying attention. Well, what is, Father, what are you doing right now? What are you saying right now? So that I can be that messenger and say what you're saying. So I can cooperate and participate with you in what you're doing We were made for relationships, we know, because we are made uh, after our God, who is, a, who is Trinity, a Trinity of persons. He's, God is relationships. He's a Trinity of persons in self-giving and receiving love, community of persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In Genesis 1, 26, God says, let us make mankind in our image after our likeness. And so God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So when God wanted to make an image of himself, he made a community of persons, <laughs> male and female, to be in relationship with each other and with him. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Those two words come, coming together, image and likeness, mean let us make mankind our children, our sons and daughters. Because a few, a few uh, chapters later, it says that a- Adam had, had us, Adam, um, uh, I forget the exact words, the wording, but basically Adam bore a child after his own image, in his own likeness, and he named him Abel. <laughs> so it's that same combination, image and likeness. And, and Abel was Adam's son. 
So if we're made in the image and likeness of God, we are God's sons, God's daughters. Are made to be. I know these are really basic, but it's important just to kind of stay on that, on that mindset and always come back to the question, because whatever we see Jesus doing in the Gospels, he's showing us how to live as a child of God. Everything he does, everything he says, everything, every way he acts, and, and everything he's doing is a model for us to follow, an example, and we are empowered to follow. This relationship with God um, is, is what life is all about. In the Gospels, Jesus tells us um, that basically eternal life, eternal life is a relationship with God. John 17, 3, Jesus says, This is eternal life, that they would know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So that, that's it. That's eternal life. A relationship with the Father and Jesus. Not just a relationship, but a knowing, an experiential knowing relationship. This is eternal life, that they would know you, Father, and that they would know, that, that they would know Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Remember, like the word, when Adam knew Eve, they bore a child. Like it's a really intimate knowing it's not just knowing about someone. I really know you. I'm in relationship with you. I know your heart. You know my heart. We're sharing life together. And that knowing, is e that's eternal life. That's eternal life. It's e some, eternal life is something that begins here and now and continues for all eternity. <laughs> it's that relationship with God that begins here and now and continues on for all eternity. We're not just waiting for heaven to, after we die. We're not just waiting to enter into eternal life after we die. It all starts right now. And, and, and as we're living in this relationship, this, as we're growing in knowledge and love of God right now, we have, that's where we get our great hope. That, and, and that's where there's no room for fear of dying. Because dying is just a doorway to eternity that we've already been living in, already been tasting. We don't know what it's going to be like, but we know who we're going to be with. We know who we're going to be with. The only true God and Jesus Christ whom he sent. We know them because we're in a relationship with them. We grow in relationship with them through prayer, worship, and scriptures. You know, we're going to build into that. But this is, so this is what we're called to walk in. This kind of relationship with God that leaves no room for fear because it actually is a be, it's beginning eternal life right now, right here, right now on earth. Heaven on earth is your quiet time with God. We know this is really important because Jesus said many different times in the Gospels and many different ways. Uh, for example, <clears throat> what we talk a lot about doing the, the, the signs and wonders and miracles of Jesus, the healing and casting out of demons. And one time Jesus says, you know, at, at the end, at, at the end, the people will come up to him and say, Jesus, let us in the heaven, let us in the heaven, you know. And if we, you know, did we not, did we not, um, drive out demons in your name? Did we not heal in your name? Did we not do so many signs and wonders and miracles in your name? And Jesus will declare to them, depart from me, I never knew you. I never knew you. Well, that's kind of crazy that you could actually heal Somebody could be healed. You could, you could just pray for somebody in the name of Jesus and they could be healed, but you don't have a good relationship with God. 
You don't actually even know him. Remember, there was a, a part in the Gospels when I think it was John or somebody ran up to Jesus and said, Lord, we saw somebody driving out demons in your name and healing in your name. You know, but they weren't with us, so we told them, stop that. You can't do that. And Jesus said, I'll leave them alone, you know. So just about anybody, God will work through anybody. <laughs> but he's not necessarily after that because the whole purpose of all those signs, wonders, and miracles is to bring somebody into an encounter with God so they can choose him, choose to be in relationship with him. So what a shame if we do those things without being in relationship with him. That's why our, all those things need to flow out of our relationship with him. But this is, what it, this is what it comes down to, eternal life, the last judgment, everything that's going to, you know, how am I going to get into heaven? Do you and I know Jesus? Or will he say, you, you did a lot of great things, but I never knew you. Yeah, you were... You were, you were a good lector at Mass. You were a good usher. You were a good greeter. You were a good Eucharistic minister. You did run and help the poor a lot. You did a lot of great things, but I, I never knew you. <laughs> you never said hi to me. You never spent time with me. You knew a lot of people, but you didn't know me. <laughs> That's what it comes down to. Eternal life, that they would know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And being in that relationship with God, growing in that knowledge and love with God, is already a taste of heaven on earth, of eternal life right now. And this is the most important thing. It's our whole purpose. This is the best thing we can hand on to our children, a relationship with God. Because it's the only thing we can hand on to them that will last forever. Everything else you can't take with you. It's the only thing they can take with them when they die. So it's the best thing, the most important thing. To some, Jesus declared, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So we actually see when Jesus called the 12 in Mark chapter 3, 14, when he called the 12 to follow him, it says he called them and appointed them for two reasons. One, that they might be with him. That they might be with him. They might be in relationship with him. And two, that he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. So first, that they would be with him, in relationship with him, and then he would send them out to do something. First you have to be, and then you, have, then you can go do. It's a philosophical principle if you took any philosophy, right? Being precedes doing. Being precedes doing. And you need, Jesus wants both and... But the preferential, the one, he, the one that has the highest importance, they're both necessary, but the highest importance one is the being. Remember the little story of Martha and Mary? Right? And Mary sits at his feet and Martha's running around crazy. One is being with Jesus, the other is doing for Jesus. Both are important, but the being, he said, was the best part, the best thing. It's more important to be with Jesus than to do things for Jesus. This, that helps us put, sometimes it helps us put our prayer life in check. Because sometimes we can fall into the little trap of, well, my, my work is my prayer. Well, no, that's just an excuse for doing too much. <laughs> 
it's important to pray as you work, pray everything we do, but you've got to have one-on-one -on -one time. You know, spouses love playing with the children together, but they do need romantic one-on-one -on -one time for their relationship to grow. We can pray the rosary in the car on the way to work. You know, you can talk to your spouse in the car on the way to work, but you do need one-on-one -on -one undistracted time together. You need both and. But you do need the one-on-one -on -one undistracted time together. That's when it re your relationship really grows. That's when you get deep. That's when you can actually share a heart. That's one of the first places we get to. It's the main place we get to, to, um, to be in a relationship with God and grow in our relationship with God is our prayer life. Spending time with God. Teresa of Avila is called prayer, intimate conversation with God. Intimate conversation with God. Can you have intimate conversation with your spouse in the middle of Los Angeles traffic? People honking all over the place. Can you have intimate conversation with God in the middle, with your spouse in the middle of a frat party? <laughs> intimate conversation with God requires being in a quiet place together where you can focus and there's no distractions, where you can just look in each other's eyes and hear each other's heartbeat sometimes. And that, just, that, that reminds us that's, re that's really the goal of prayer is, is to, to be with him. It doesn't really matter what is said during prayer, even what is heard during prayer. Or if scripture is read during prayer, or five rosaries are prayed during the prayer. Did you connect? Were you, did you be with him? That's the goal of all prayer is to be with him. Be still and know that I am God. As St. Augustine says, the goal of prayer for us is, you know, be with him so that we can, we can discover God's will. Prayer is not so we can change God's mind or change his will to our will, but so we can discover God's will and then change our will to be God's will. We want to know, what are you thinking, Father? Jesus, what's your heart like? What are you feeling right now about this situation? Because that's, that's what I want to feel. That's what I want to know. That's what I want to, that's what I want. What do you want in this situation? That's what I want. Okay, quick little activation time, reflection journaling time. First question, who is your favorite person in the Old Testament? And why? And if you don't have any clue who's in the Old Testament, there's your homework. Find somebody who's in the Old Testament. Who's your favorite person in the Old Testament and why? Why are they your favorite? What do you admire about their relationship with God? What do you admire about their relationship with God? I 
And whatever that is, just take a little moment. Don't worry about if he's listening or not. And just ask God for that same thing right now. Whatever it is you admire about somebody else's relationship they have with God in the Old Testament, ask God for that for you right now. So, for example, my favorite person in the Old Testament, uh, I really do have a lot, but for this one, I'm just going to choose Moses because it says, Moses is the only one that said, talks to God face to face as one person talks to another. And darn it all, that's what I want. (laughs) I want to be able to talk to God face to face and like one person talking to another and hear him that quickly, you know, that clearly. So that's what I ask God for. Lord, let me talk to you face to face like Moses. You can do, on your own, you can do that same exercise question with somebody in the New Testament. You know, what's a favorite person you have in the New Testament? Why? And what do you admire about their relationship with God? And then ask God to give that to you as well. I didn't want to do New Testament first because everybody would say Mary or somebody like that, you know. Make it challenging. Choose somebody in the Old Testament. Okay, let's do some um, practical mindset stuff. Having a relationship with God. These are just some ways to think about things. So I think it's very helpful when we think about our relationship with God and growing in a relationship with God and what that means, with, you know, how to do that when we think about how would we grow in a relationship with anybody else? How would I grow in a relationship with a new friend? How would I grow in a relationship with a new boyfriend or girlfriend I was interested in? How do you grow in a relationship with a spouse? You know, choose somebody that's real in front of you that you're in a relationship with or growing in a relationship with and say, and and then that's how you you compare. I want to grow in a relationship with this person, so that's how I, those are the same things I do to grow in a relationship with God. What's the first thing you have to do? Spend time. (laughs) You want to grow in a relationship with a boyfriend, girlfriend? Spend time with them, right? You don't just ignore them like for a couple months and hopefully things yeah hopefully we're getting more romantic right now i haven't talked to you or seen you forever but like no like when you want to you just have to spend time with you pursue intentional time to be around them it's not even always important what you're doing but just to hang out together just want to be together And so we have to do the same thing with God. Pursue intentional time and moments to be with him. There's times we have to pursue God. There's times we let God pursue us. And we just respond to the pursuing. But but in every relationship, every relationship is a lot of work. And so in every relationship that you want to grow, you and I want to grow, we have to be very intentional about it and set apart time, and don't let anything interrupt that time. And not just to be with them, but then to talk with them. Then you begin to share your heart with them and your life with them. And maybe your sharing is very superficial at first, you know, but then pretty soon it needs to start getting deeper where you're sharing your dreams and your hopes and desires and, you know, um, even fears and faults and failures and maybe authentic needs that you have deep inside you. And then you're listening, you're pressing in. Well, what do you think, God? (laughs) You know? What are your dreams? What's your heart? What's something on your heart right now? And you you press in. Um, So 
St. Teresa of Avila, she, when she was starting this as a Carmelite, they had de designated holy hour time. And as she was trying, as she was growing, beginning this, she had, she hated it. <laughs> she said, one hour, this is the most boring, agonizing hour of my life. What am I supposed to do for an hour? You know, she couldn't sit still. She couldn't focus. And she says in her, in, you know, in her life works, as you're reading in her, her life works about prayer, she says she just began with the clock. <laughs> I said, well, I just resolve to give you this hour of the day. This is your hour. Whatever you want to do with it, you do with it. I'm just going to do everything I can to stay here. <laughs> and not leave this room. She, she was bored out of her mind. And so the, her beginning prayer for her was just sitting in the room with God and being resolved, I will not leave this room, and I will not leave your presence until the clock, this alarm clock goes off and one hour has gone by. And she just did that until finally her body began getting trained to just be there. Sometimes that's how it is with new relationships, right? You don't really know what to do or what to say. You're too nervous, but you just got to want to be around the person. You know, my, uh, um, me and I have three younger sisters, and two of them have moved out here after, <clears throat> after me, shortly after me. And uh, you know, there was a little break in the relationships. You know, we didn't really hang out that much in, uh, in Vegas together. And, and mostly our mom kind of was the glue that gelled the family together. And when mom passed away, man, man, now if we're going to be in a relationship, gosh, we have to do it, you know. And so when they were out here, we, we said, okay, let's, let's, be, let's try to have family time together. So, you know, Sunday after mass or after wherever you go to church, we get together for lunch. We're just going to hang out at the park all afternoon together. And, and we're just going to just, let's just practice being around each other, you know. You wouldn't know what to say all the time, you know. But we just said, well, we're just going to hang out. And, and, you know, pretty soon you know what to say and you're just sharing life again, you know, a couple of times. But at first we had to just get used to being each other's presence. And that's the same thing with God. Like at first you just have to, when you're sitting down to, for prayer and pursuing this relationship with him, you just have to just be in his presence. Just get used to being there. You know, just kind of, I guess, being with yourself, too, sometimes. <laughs> no distractions. So the, that's the first, the first step is setting that time that says, this is, this is our time together. It doesn't have to be a holy hour every day, you can, but it should start off probably 10 or 15 minutes every day. You know? How many of you, when you... Maybe just crazy me, huh? When you're young and in love, you know, you would stay up way late on the phone, breathing, breathing on the phone, right? You're not really even saying stuff most of the time, but just didn't want to go to bed. You wanted to be with the person. And so what'd you do? You sacrificed your sleep, didn't you? You know? Maybe just crazy me, huh? How many of us, we will, we won't sacrifice 15 minutes of sleep to wake up a little more early for God in the morning? Come on, you know. Pretend like God's a girlfriend or a boyfriend, you know. Get back in love. Love makes you forget yourself, huh? So this is the first, this is, this is kind of, you know, practical ways of growing a relationship with God. Always come back, okay, I want to get in a better relationship with you. How, what, what are the things I would do to get in a better relationship with my, with a boyfriend, girlfriend, a spouse? What would I do? You know, okay, I'm going to try that with you. You know, you want to get in a better relationship, a good relationship, be in a good relationship with your spouse, and you live alone, you know, or you're single, and you pretend you have a spouse, and so then, you, what would I do to be in a good relationship? Well, when I come home, I guess I'd say hi to them, probably. So I guess when I go home every day from work, I should say hi, Jesus. Right? You'd walk in the room, you'd walk in the house, and you go find your spouse and probably say hi and a hug and a kiss, right? 
Go walk in your house, find Jesus, sit down, give him a hug and a kiss. You have, to, you have to walk in and do a holy hour. Walk in and take five seconds and say hi and give God a hug and a kiss. Say, how was your day? It's that practical. We have, these, are, these are habits that we can grow in to grow in our relationship with God. You know, if you just imagine, what else would I do? You know, let's say, you know, you're single. And you're, you're gonna, would, you, would you really eat dinner in front of the TV and ignore your spouse? Or would you eat dinner on the table and talk to your spouse? You better eat at the table and talk to your spouse, for crying out loud. If you don't, don't come see me. I'll send you a good marriage and family life counselor, you know. Do you want to grow in a better relationship with God? Keep coming back to the real relationships you have in your life or the real relationships you hope to have or want in your life. And whatever you would do for those things, start doing for, with God. Not all at once, just start in the small things. Okay, for, for the next 21 days, all I'm going to do to grow in a better relationship with God is when I come home every day, when I leave the house every day, I'll say, Bye, Jesus even though I know he's coming with me. And I come home, I'm going to say, I'm going to go find him. Hi, Jesus, I'm home. I missed you. Hug, kiss. How was your day, Jesus? Doesn't take long. He might sit you down and have a long, have a talk to you, tell you how his day was. You never know. Got to at least ask, right? So those little practical things, these are like practical mindset for growing in relationship with God. Practical ways. <clears throat> Whatever you would do with a real person, start doing with God. A real person that you're in love with. Start doing that with God. Watch how it grows. When, when I was in seminary, I developed a relationship with a uh, hermit monk couple of the people in his community and discerning with him and uh, so when you we get to go hang out at the monast their little monastery a, a few times it was a four bedroom house they're in, they're in the city and every time we came home he, we, he came home we come in, the, come in the house he'd walk in the house and say hi house hi Jesus and they walk through, drop everything, you know, they carry, carry in the groceries, drop them on the table, go to the chapel where Jesus was in the Blessed Sacrament. And they go and kneel down, put their head on the altar, and their arms on the altar like they're giving him a hug. Huh? Why? Because the first thing you do when you come home is you go say hi to your spouse. What's the last thing you do before bed? Good night, honey. I love you. What's the first thing you do in the morning? Good morning, honey. I love you. How'd you sleep? The second thing we have to look at is we're just talking in general about growing in a relationship with God, is we have to look at it in, the, in, in respects as, you know, th relationships, like everything in our life, grow really slowly. They really do. They take a lot of time, effort, energy. And so, you know, look at it. Uh, so don't, don't be like, oh, I tried to pray one time. It didn't work at all, so forget it, you know. Or I tried this 15 minutes a day thing for one week and that, I didn't notice anything. I don't feel connected at all. Well, you know, if you go to the gym one time, is anything going to happen? You know, if you go to the gym for one week and that's it, is anything going to happen besides sore muscles? <laughs> you know, of course not. Well, they say you got to go to the gym and work out consistently, you know, every few days, three, four days a week, for three months, and then you, then you can see your body starting to get in shape. Three months? Now try that 
Now keep going to the gym, you know, three, four times a week for six months, nine, ten months, one year. Ah, now I'm seeing the six-pack coming right here. Huh? Now we're chiseling out. Now we're getting strong. Now I feel the endurance in my lungs when I run. Now I see the progress. Oh, one year, two years, three years. Well, now you're seeing the progress. Same thing in our relationship with God, huh? You give God that 15 minutes every day for three months. And then tell me there's no connectedness. Then tell me, in three months you'll start to see, you'll start to get in shape in your relationship with God. You'll start to see and recognize some connectedness. So maybe not a six-pack yet, but maybe you at least have two packs there in the spirit, you know? You'll start to hear his voice, recognize his touch, sense his presence. You give God three months, six months, nine months, one year of going to the spiritual gym. Guaranteed you will see results in that relationship. So we have to look at it like that. Everything in our life grows slowly. And you got to put the road work in. You got to put the time in. And you don't look at just results. You know, you don't, when you're trying to lose weight, no, you don't get on the scale every day, right? Maybe every week. But every day you don't notice the difference. And sometimes you, you know, you make yourself all nervous because one day you gained a pound instead of losing a pound, you know? No, you, you do it in big chunks over time. Same thing in our relationship with God. It's going to take time. Put the road work in. It's a long-term thing. It's a relationship thing. Just resolve, I'm in this relationship. Till death are we fully united. <laughs> when we're making time for God, as we started to say, making room for God in our life, we have to do it in practical ways. So those short practical things that are already part of your life, waking up, saying hi to the one you love, before you go to bed, saying good night to the one you love, leaving the house, coming home to the house. Anybody have coffee in the morning to wake up? How about a little coffee with God? Yeah? Good morning, Lord. I'll, I'll, I'll. I'm just happy to be here with you. I'm, I'll, I'll be a little more talkative in a few minutes, <laughs> you know. But now we're just going to be together drinking coffee. What are those natural ways you can align, grow in your relationship with God practically, naturally, practically, so that God becomes more a part of your life and not just something you're trying to add on top of everything else you're already doing? <laughs> But how do I integrate God more fully in my life already in natural ways? So the morning, the evening, leaving work, coming home from work, coffee with God, coffee breaks at work with God. You know, I remember when I was doing pro computer programming, we get different 10 minute breaks throughout the day and I just grab coffee, go sit outside where nobody else was and I say, okay, God, me and you, 10 minutes, what do you got, <laughs> you know? 10 minutes, I, I got a little extra time with you until I finish this cup of coffee, you know? This is little chicken times, you know? You ever, you ever in love with somebody and you got a little 10 minute break at work so you go and call them on the phone? Or you send them a little text, I love you, thinking of you. You know, we have to do these little check-ins with God, too, you know. Let's just pause right there. Activation, reflection, notebook time. <clears throat> uh, we're going to ask questions about all these things. One, do you, have, do you have a set time that you spend with God every day? A one-on-one -on -one time, undistracted time. That's 10 or 15 minutes, at least. If you do, when is that? If you don't, 
When can that be? Figure that out right now with God. Ask him to help you reveal it. And write it down. And make that commitment to him. Besides that, 10 to 15 minutes a day, guaranteed, un, uh, that's dedicated, undistracted time with God every day. What's one other practical thing you can add on top of that that we already mentioned? Whether it's training yourself, when you wake up in the morning, you say, good morning, God, I love you. Or you're gonna go to bed and you say, good night, God, I love you. Or when you come home each day from work, or from this encounter here, as soon as you get home, you say, hi, house, hi, Jesus. You go find Jesus and give him a hug and a kiss. Maybe you'll add that. What's one of those little practical things you can add into your day that you, you can commit to starting tonight? One thing, another thing to, that's important to keep in mind is that everybody's relationship with God is different and, 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 and God relates to each one of us differently according to and, and much, much often according to our personality. So as different as our personalities are from each other, God relates to each one of us in that different, unique way. You know, not merely extroverted and introverted, you know, but... There's, some un- there's a lot of uniqueness about each of our personalities, and God relates to us right there. And so that takes a little pressure off, because God knows how to relate to you. He knows how to get our attention if he really wants to. And he speaks to each one of us differently or uniquely One of the the basic ways to recognize God's voice speaking to us is to recognize that, one, when God speaks, it's usually a spontaneous, it's a spontaneous thing. So it's like one of those those light light bulb moments, you know, aha, whoa, it's all at once. So God doesn't speak word by word by word by word, but when he speaks, the whole concept comes all at once. He doesn't say, I love you, you just all of a sudden know you're loved. So he speaks spontaneous and all at once when he speaks. That's how you tell the difference between your thoughts and God's thoughts because our thoughts are step by step, word by word. Very analytical like that, planned out. It takes me a while to finish one sentence, but it takes God that fast to finish one sentence. You know? So that's one way we begin to discern my voice, God's voice. But God also, we recognize, speaks from within us, using us. So he speaks with, through our natural faculties, through thoughts, words, images, feelings, emotions, gut feeling, gut instinct. 
Sometimes you just, all of a sudden, you just know the answer. You don't know how you know, but you know. So sometimes you can, then there's usually, God can speak through any of those ways, and sometimes there's usually like one or two of those that, that he speaks more frequently or that we, rec- we're, we're just e- we, we recognize more easily how, that he's speaking. So it's a real relationship. So God speaks, but we have to kind of learn to recognize his voice. It's almost like if you're falling, in, you know, recognize the language he's using to speak. Like if you're falling in love with a foreign exchange person, you know. And one of the ways you can grow in recognition of his voice is, is by question and answer. So I asked a girl one time during a school mass, or I asked, you know, school mass, how many of you kids have, know, have heard God's voice before? And some of them raised their hands. So, you know, a little girl in the front row, I said, well, so you heard God's voice? Yeah, I said, well, how do you know it was God's voice and not something else? And she said, well, because he answered my question. <laughs> You know, like, duh. I got an answer to my question. I said, all right. There you go, right? There's, there's the first way we re- can learn to recognize God's voice. Sit down, get quiet with him, put our attention on him, and ask him a question. And then wait for an answer. What you do is you, you wait with your attention on him, for that first response that he speaks within you. Whether it's the first thought, the first word, the first phrase, the first image, the first memory that comes, the first feeling or emotion that comes, the first gut instinct that comes. What's the first thing that comes after you ask that question and while you're just waiting in his presence? And you just kind of do that little exercise and let that grow. And, and, you, and he, he'll use all those things to, to speak and answer questions for you or to share his heart with you, share his thoughts with you. But you'll notice in time there tends to be one or two of those ways that, that you, you recognize his voice speaking stronger, more clearly. So, for example, for me, I recognize God's voice most clearly through kind of a a gut knowing and then when I know I just go I almost never hear his voice through images almost never I'd say 2% of the time I almost hate it when people are trying to do prayer exercises and they say close your eyes imagine this picture in your head because it just, I just, it does not come naturally to me. It's re, I, it almost is distracting to me to try to get a picture in this head. But for other people, that's the first and easiest way for them to recognize God's voice is through images and visions and pictures and memories. And it's so easy. That was Teresa of Avila. That was, Teresa of Avila, that was so easy and natural for her. She learned to pray. She would just read the Gospels and she'd, when, she, when she's reading a passage, she would just close her eyes and picture the gospel scene and everybody there. And then what, you know, what kind of day it was and what did it smell like and was the wind blowing and, and she picture herself there with them, watching them. And she'd get that scene and then she'd just watch that, that image in her head. And sometimes she would see God kind of take over and move the image and make things happen. I tried that so hard using her book, I could never do it. You know, so, so, you know, it's okay to try these little exercises to see. There will usually be one or two. God will indeed, through, at some point in your life, speak to you in all those different ways. But there's usually one or two stronger ways that he speaks to you with. And so part of it is just learning to recognize that. And then you grow in confidence that, yeah, I am hearing his voice, you know. So, you know, this week, as you're practicing, or over the next two weeks as you're practicing, you know, just ask little simple questions. 
Jesus, do you love me? Jesus, how do you want to speak to me? God, what do you want to say to me right now? God, I got a really hard day today. I have to meet with this person. <laughs> now, my boss. You know, what do you, th here's what I think about them. What do you think about them? <laughs> You know, simple little dialogues and pauses. And every time you ask a little question or do say something to God, just have yourself pause and then pay attention to how, what's going on in you. Are thoughts coming? Are images coming? Are feelings coming? Is, this, is there a gut instinct, a knowing inside you that's growing? So you know, sometimes the, maybe you may notice nothing at first, but if you keep going after the fourth or fifth or sixth time, all of a sudden you'll hear something. So sometimes you can just start with the same question over and over until he gives you an answer, you know. We did it here many times. Jesus, do you love me? Because you know the answer is yes, but you want to hear him say it, you know. I know you love me, but I want to hear you say it still. And so one of the one of the parishioners finally shared with me one time, you know, I was getting mad at all this. Every time you're asking these questions and we're trying to listen with you and nothing, I'm not getting nothing out of this. God's not speaking to me. I'm kind of thinking this is baloney, you know, but I just kept doing it, doing it. I'm asking the question every day, every day. Finally, after the sixth time, I asked him, do you love me, Jesus? And, and he told me, yes, I do love you. He said, he, he, I finally heard him tell me. I love you. And as soon as I heard it inside me, I knew it, and I just, my, I just started crying. I couldn't stop crying. Touched by God's voice speaking, you know. So sometimes we just have to be patient with the process, especially if this is new, new to us and we're not used to hearing or recognizing God's voice. Patience and perseverance, patience and perseverance. And boy, because when he speaks, you will know it. It's like, it'll be like an, it's an encounter with the living God. He, he'll it, he touches you. Just to uh, close and let Peggy come up and see how she wants to close the night. But we'll just close with a little prayer. I'm just going to ask God to give you what he's given to me, just a little impartation of giving. I'm just going to ask him to give you the different things in my relationship with him that I feel I've received or experienced and may ask him to do the same times 100 with you as well. So if you like that, you can just, let's just posture ourselves for prayer and just receptivity to receive and whatever he wants to give us or how he wants to speak to us right now. And I'll just pray, Father, I just want to thank you for this time. Thank you again for this time with you and letting us be in your presence and for being with us. Thank you so much that, uh, for allowing us, inviting us to have a real relationship with you, the living, true God, a relationship as your sons and daughters. Just that statement, Father, just that kind of relationship can bring up many wounds inside of us and maybe we need healing there. What does it mean to be a son, to be a daughter? What does it mean to be loved, by, loved perfectly by a father? Father, just pray that you bring healing to us, touch us and speak to us your love and Bring any healing we need if we have any of any of those wounds. Father, I just ask that you would impart to everyone here all that you've given me in my relationship with you. Uh, impart to them a hunger for you, a hunger to hear your voice, a hunger to see your face. Impart to them just clarity and simplicity in, in growing and in, in building a relationship with you. Simplicity, practical ways of saying hi, saying I love you, giving you hugs, 
practical ways of sitting quietly with you and especially give them right now, Lord, just a, a special sense of your presence. Just as you've allowed me to sense and recognize your stillness, almost by a high-pitched sound that comes in sometimes, I pray you give them that recognition too, to recognize your presence through a special stillness and the at- something that shifts the atmosphere, something that's almost tangible for them. Fill them with your Holy Spirit in a fresh new way today, this evening, just like you did to me many years ago, and just fill them with your Holy Spirit in, in such a way that it, it changes their whole life and there's, it becomes impossible, impossible to not recognize your presence, impossible to not know that you exist and that you love them. Give them that kind of encounter with you, Lord. Something that will change their whole life in such a way that they can never go back to the old way they were. Just touch them tonight, Lord. Pray all these things, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.